Hello and welcome to our 2023 rules meeting. Joining us today is Casey Logan, our state rules interp for Colorado. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Casey. I have a few things to go over for you today and then I'll turn it over to get our rules um, and PowerPoint presentation going. Uh, this bulletin uh, for track and field will be posted as of February 2nd. So any new changes or new things coming for this upcoming season will be in that bulletin and you can find um, anything you may need for the uh, remainder of the season, along with dates and um, deadlines for certain things. And I'll run through those really quickly. February 23rd will be uh, the last day to turn in qualifying meets. That is with a late fee of $60 at this point, but you can turn those up to uh, 3 p.m. on February 23rd. Our first practice will be Monday, February 27th. And our first scrimmage will be March 4th with our first contest being March 9th. Um, with that being said, we do have a roster input date that we have worked with Mile Split and Max Preps to kind of take something off your plate and you can only enter that or only have to enter that roster in once and that deadline is March 3rd. Uh, we do have some directions of what that looks like in the bulletin, but as long as you get your roster into Mile Split before March 3rd, it'll automatically roll over to Max Preps. So we encourage you to do that. Otherwise you'll be inputting it twice. Um, as we get to the declaration process at the end of the year, that declaration process will open May 4th and doesn't close until May 15th, which gives you a pretty good window to get your kids um, declared into that meet. As we always say, you can declare as far down as you want. We have uh, went pretty far in that declaration process, moving kids forward. Um, so it is at your discretion how deep you go, but we encourage you, you can declare all of your students if you wish to. Um, what we ask is that if you intend not to have a student participate in any running event and or field event, that you do not declare them as you take an opportunity away from someone else, um, knowing if you're going, if you already know that you are not going to have that student participate. So we just ask that you be mindful of that. Um, what we do ask for is that if you are running a track, qualifying meet that you take advantage of our um, website and on chastanow.org um, under track and there's a lot of checklists and feedback that we've been given um, over the years kind of put together to help you run a successful meet and we also encourage feedback so if you're at a meet and there's some things that aren't flowing well or things that we can do from the state office to help support those meets please let us know um, and if you are a meet director we we um, definitely recommend you use these there's been a lot of thought and process put into those from our state officials um, and they, you know, they're a working documents. So if there's things that you see or things that you think we can add, we'd love to do so. Um, again, at this time, I would love to introduce Casey Logan. I've been a state rules interp for a very long time, uh, my entire time here. Um, but he's just been such an asset to the track and field world along with cross country. Um, and I know that he is highly respected amongst coaches officials and everyone across the state in this community. And so again, we thank Casey Logan for joining us today and uh, we'll run through the NFHS rules and PowerPoint. Well, thanks, Jen, uh, appreciate it. Uh, we'll be looking at the 20, uh, 23 changes, rule changes, uh, editorial changes and the National Federation's points of emphasis. And we'll also be looking today at um, just points of emphasis and, and some changes that are that are happening in Colorado specific to uh, how we handle uh, track and field here in our state. So here we start with the rule changes. I think one thing you're, you'll probably notice, just like I did when I was at the National Interps meeting a while back, um, one, one thing that you will see in the presentation today and was mentioned by the chairman of the rules committee um, is that you know, they've really gone through the rule book. There's really no major, major rule changes that impact the sport. So pretty much what you're gonna see today is um, just more uh, wording and verbiage that, clar that clarifies some of the rules um, that they thought would just make the rule book better. Uh, they felt that the rule book was in very, very good shape as far as the rules go. So really a lot of what you'll see in what they called rule changes, really just a lot of editorial changes. So let's take a look at those first. Uh, rule 343 and uh, rule 592, um, what you see in red here on the slide 
um, talks about guidelines when the referee uh, is trying to determine a re if a race should be rerun or not. We know that the referee has sole authority to make that decision. Uh, once the referee's made that decision, it's something that cannot be uh, appealed or taken to the jury of appeals for um, to be overturned. Um, but there is a list uh, that has been added to Rule 343, which uh, is where the referee's authority is laid out in the rule book. Uh, these things are not new. They had previously been in the in the case books for several years. So what they did was they moved that verbiage from the case book over to the rule book this year. And with that change in rule three, they also added uh, at the bottom of the slide to rule 592. Uh, they added in red there uh, that it, the referee can also, if a lane's not a, available for a rerun, that the referee may add an additional heat in a certain round or in the next set of rounds to accommodate an athlete or athletes that are um, uh, eligible for the rerun. In rule four, which talks about, uh, that's a section on competitors. Uh, rule 422, again, has just been reordered a little bit. You're probably familiar with that table. The table has not changed. The heading has changed. The uh, heading before said that a contestant may officially enter and then, you know, how many individual events paired with how many relay uh, car or how many uh, relays they could potentially run. And they changed the word from enter to participate. So now the heading on that table in the book says that contestants may officially participate in. They thought that uh, emphasis there to change that word to participant was very important with the way the table had been interpreted because it's really the only time a penalty is invoked isn't for a number of entries, unless we have entries beyond four in individual events, but an, a, an athlete may be entered in four individual events and of course uh, listed on, listed on uh, you know, re relay cards as an alternate, but it's actually participation that invokes um, uh, the rule where an individual has to forfeit points for, uh, participating in the, in, in, the, in the number over a four events total. So that they also moved that table from article two to article one. And so that's just the lead off there in section two with participation and entry limitations. Uh, rule 572, rule five, which governs all the rules that happen on the track. And one of those is the uh, working with the starter. The, uh, to standardize starting hold times, they have now changed the verbiage to uh, the firing of the starting device is approximately two seconds. If you look in prior rule books, that was, I believe, said between uh, one second and two seconds, usually one to two seconds. So they dropped the usually one and just went approximately two seconds. I think the committee said there was quite a discussion just on making sure that um, that kids uh, come up to the set position and have to be held there for a little bit. Also, certainly don't want to hold them too long to where they're getting twitchy in the blocks, but that seems to be an issue across a lot of the states is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of starters fire the gun uh, way too quickly. So they're trying to uh, remediate that and standardize the, uh, the time to approximately two seconds. Rule 5-2 uh, or 5-10-2, which governs um, which governs again the rule of the track. And this this is probably actually a rule change. One one word uh, I think provides uh, coaches a lot more um, flexibility here. So you can have always been able for a lot of years to enter six athletes on your relay card at qual meets or when you turn the relay cards in at the state championships. That has now been expanded to eight athletes. So you can list up to eight athletes. Of course, once those cards are turned in, any uh, participation of athletes must come from the names on those cards. Names cannot be added, and uh, or names cannot be names cannot be changed. So, uh, when it comes down to the state championships, we certainly um, encourage coaches to list as many names as they can. You just don't know what you're going to run into with athlete injuries or things like that. So, make sure that you you take advantage of that. It's also a nice opportunity for. Um, you know, for, for more kids to be involved 
uh, in an event, even as an alternate, that they're they're still involved in the meet. Uh, rule 664, just some clarifying in, in the Javelin, of course, that's not an event in, in Colorado, but there are, are at some qual meets, I know they, uh, they do use that as an added event. They added the, uh, in the Javelin throw in 664 that the first point of contact shall be within uh, the sector. And then, of course, it defines the sector. That, um, you know, rule 667 states that the measurement uh, in a javelin shall be from the nearest edge of the first point in contact. They just added that first point of contact uh, to rule 664. The word first had not been there. Uh, new rule for seven, rule seven uh, to two, section two is the specialty events section. And that's always been in the rule book that allowed um, some different specialty events to be run, such as shuttle relays, steeplechase, race walking, et cetera. They have now added a, uh, a seventh, uh, they've added mixed relays. And apparently in several uh, states, mixed relays have become a pretty popular item. So the National Federation Committee decided that they would, would, would add that. And just like all of the other um, things that are listed there, um, unless your state governs them specifically, which ours doesn't, if you are going to run any of these events, or in this case, the mixed relays, you should use the uh, USATF uh, youth rules on, on how you run those. Of course, it's an additional event, um, so you, you know, and that, that's up to um, meet directors if they're going to add that or not. Uh, rule nine, which you might remember, used to be the records uh, rule, the final uh, rule section in the book, has now uh, become um, a rule that governs uh, indoor track and field. And uh, there are currently 17 states that conduct state championships of uh, have indoor state championships. And with over 150,000 participants, and there are 21 states that sanction the activity. Uh, we're not one of those states, but again, the Federation felt that it was time to address this. This was lightly addressed before in rule number one. They've now made an, own rule, an old rule. Uh, they have uh, sections two through six on there, which, um, which, will get, which will be a quick reference for coaches and officials uh, in, in uh, uh, working with, with indoor meets. Um, you know, it's, it's also understood by the committee that, you know, indoor facilities are not uniform. Uh, there's adaptations to track size and field event availability that, you know, they have to work within what the facility allows them to do. But these are general rules. And I'm sure over the next several years, as they fine tune rule nine, we'll see a lot of additions and stuff to that as well. And then rule 10, we said rule, uh, the records rule was was nine, it's now kicked to 10. And um, this was something was just kind of an oversight last year when the rule book came out. Um, it, it talks about uh, when you remeasure for a record attempt in the vertical jumps, um, the crossbar and the base of standards to ensure consistent placement of the crossbar, any displaced or jostled crossbar should be placed on the standards exactly in the same position as before. The word or jostle had been left out last year. So, um, you know, the way we probably interpret this place is the bar actually has to, you know, fall off the standards, but it's just jostled. If it's some athlete, we see that a lot in the vertical jumps, you know, might tap, might catch the bar and it kind of bounces and jostles, but it doesn't fall off the standards. That would also be an instance where you would remeasure uh, for a record. And that pretty much wraps up uh, rule changes. Again, I kind of use that uh, term lightly because a lot of that that you saw, I mean, the actual only two rules change, I think, other than just uh, making some clarifying editorial changes would be that you can now have two additional runners that you can add to a relay card. The editorial changes should just be uh, changed because there's only one editorial change. And in the past, as you remember, I might have been last year, a couple of years ago, they are they are adding in in uh, in the different in the field event rules, um, you know, specifications for construction of new facilities. One recent one was the 
um, you know, specifications, construction specifications on horizontal uh, jump pits for the long triple jump and, you know, where you put boards and the length of the pit, the depth of the pit and so on and so forth. This one actually addresses the, tra the track in rule five. And so it is really for uh, districts and schools that are building new facilities or replacing a facility so that there are some uh, specific um, uh, items and in this case addresses uh, the length of a, the length of a track. So there's a, a variance here in this particular uh, rule of eight hundredths of a meter. So you know about eight centimeters, which is just a tad over three inches. So the length of a track should be at least four hundred meters, but it can't be any more than four hundred and eight hundredths uh, 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 meters. So this really goes into effect with tracks constructed after January 2024, so another year. But I think the most important thing to state here on this slide is that this only deals with new construction. So if you're putting in a brand new facility, uh, then this would apply. If you are tearing up your existing facility, in other words, you're actually lifting the whole footprint of that track out and laying a new one, then this would apply after 2024. This does not apply to resurfacing your track. It does not apply to restriping your track. So it's only for, uh, for new construction, as we said. The points of emphasis this year in the, um, in the back of the rule book, the first one is sportsmanship. And um, this was a big one across all uh, 17 rule books that the National Federation publishes. So this was their number one thing, and, and they might vary a little bit from rule book to rule book, but I think a lot of the verbiage is, is just the same. We know sportsmanship is becoming more of an issue across all sports and in all, and in all states. And um, you know the whole idea for the Federation is to promote respect, integrity, and, um, and sportsmanship. But obviously, there's a lot of working parts to that because you're dealing with uh, you know, coaches, you're dealing with athletes, you're dealing with officials, and of course, you're dealing with uh, with spectators as well. So um, said here, just as we said on this slide, that's their number one point of emphasis for the, uh, you know, 23 school year and um, all the different uh, parts of that. And then on the next slide, which you can read, and obviously this is in the rule book, which you can address too, but, um, you know, they just have some concerns with you know, um, how officials are treated or how spectators are treated, athletes are treated and so on and so forth. So again, uh, very high on the, uh, very high on the list for the, for the Federation. And the next one um, in this track specific is just uh, an emphasis on protesting and appeals uh, processes. Okay. And making sure that the people under, the people understand that across the board, uh, the referee's decision uh, in all matters is final. And, you know, you may be at meets where uh, there is no jury of appeals. And in that case, then it's the referee's decision. And if you're going to make an appeal, you need to go talk to the referee. At some meets where a jury of appeals has been appointed, then, um, then a coach may, you know, talk to the referee, but if they're not satisfied, then they can go and actually make an appeal to the, uh, uh, to the jury. Uh, as we said back with the uh, with the rerun slide, the first one we talked about, um, you know that even if there is a jury of appeals, that is uh, the jury of appeals has no uh, factor in determining a rerun. That is solely the referee's decision. There are other places where the jury of appeals can look at um, can actually take uh, take a part in in an appeal, but those are limited as, as well too, and those are listed in the rule book. And they're listed here. So there are some things that can be appealed. Uh, and more importantly, in the next slide, um, the things that, that cannot be uh, appealed. And so uh, things that are not appealable are judgment decisions uh, pertaining to violations or alleged violations. So that could be interference, that could be uh, team out of an exchange zone, those types of things. Um, obviously, the finished judges and timers, um, unless that involves a misapplication of a rule, and for the start of a race, whether a start is uh, fair and legal. And the other thing, obviously, that that uh, can't ever be used is uh, video replay, 
uh, of any kind coming from anywhere. The only video replay, I guess, if it falls in that category or monitoring equipment is what is approved by the games committee at the official finish. So the third and final point of emphasis is uh, is cross country safety. And I, you know, I think that probably applies to track as well, because uh, we know that when you're training your cross country athletes that you do get out on the roads and and it's the same thing in track. I mean, track uh, track distance runners would have several workouts on the track that, you know, earlier in the season, they're laying down some base miles as well. And so they're probably out on the roads and we're not laying that down on the track. Um, I think the one thing that um, really jumped out to me when the National Federation is starting collecting this data is that since uh, the decade from 2011 to 2021, there were nine deaths and two disabling injuries uh, for middle school and high school athletes uh, that were running for their, their school in, uh, in cross country or track. So important that, um, that coaches that are dealing with, with uh, those athletes that run the distances really have uh, a plan in place for when they do send athletes out on the road and uh, very specific, um, very specific kind of rules the road for your athletes and uh, make, make sure they know where they can run, where they can't run, which side of the road you want them to run on, um, you know, no headphones, those, you know, those types of things. And in, and in, the, uh, in these slides and also uh, in the back of the book, they uh, they have several of uh, several of these suggestions uh, as well, but uh, really communicating with your athletes before you send them out there, and and um, you know even double checking and having some safety checks throughout the season because you know we we just certainly don't want anything to happen to any uh, to anybody out there uh, running on the running on the roads. So let's switch over to the uh, the Colorado um, points of emphasis here. Probably, you know, not a, a, probably the best way to say that. Um, the first thing, and I, I know right away you focus right on uniform up there in the heading, but um, th this is not, nothing has changed with the with the uniform rule or guidelines. Nothing's changed since 2019 in the act from the National Federation, the rule book when the major change for uniforms uh, came into uh, came into effect. And then at that time, uh, to clarify how we were interpreting the National Federation rules, we came up with these uniform guidelines that we uh, all agreed upon for the state of Colorado uh, to kind of how we were how we were going to determine compliance uh, for uh, uniforms and, and especially relay uniforms, which which you know are have have changed a little bit. Um, and if you remember last year, we had to tweak that a little bit because as manufacturers change their uniforms and what we're starting to see, there were some some issues where, you know, side panels that were not uh, were not an issue. Now we have side panels on some uniforms that start to curl around to the front or curl around to the back, whether it be on the shorts or the um, or the uniform top. And so we added what you see in bold there. So that's nothing new. It's just a reminder that we're still using, just like we did in cross country, just like we did in track last year, we will use these same guidelines uh, for the upcoming 2023 season. Uh, the exchange zones, remember the exchange zones that said changed um, to the to the 30 meter zone. Um, this was just kind of an emphasis. So we'll make this emphasis for officials too. Uh, the medley that you see bold there, there, there seem to be some discrepancies in how the medley was run last year. And, there, and it always seems to be that last uh, exchange because it's a 400 meter um, runner that is running that last uh, exchange. But since it's the 200 meter that's coming in by rule, if, it, if the incoming runner is running 200 meters or less, then the zone is 30, you know, regardless of what that next runner is running for their leg. So they're also posted on the, uh, on the website. I uh, believe we got that up a couple days ago. Uh, it, it talks, there's a, there's a officiating the 800 meter uh, medley and there's some specific steps there to follow for each exchange and so on that may assist uh, meet directors or coaches and certainly officials uh, as well. Uh, these are uh, statements that, that 
I, I think they're widely known, but we've never put them in the bulletin. So these have now been added to the bulletin. So I wanna make sure we clarified them. Uh, marks and events where boys and girls compete against one another will not be considered for state qualifying marks. So we know in the rule book in rule one, it does address a situation, um, you know, if there's impending weather or something, a lot of times it seems to, you know, come down towards the end of the meet, you know, potentially the 3,200 meter run uh, could be the four by four that, hey, if we can, if we can combine both boys and girls into one event, you know, we'll beat this impending thunderstorm. Another situation where we've, we've heard it happen is, you know, well, we've got, you know, we have three boys that are entered in the 3,200 meter run. Uh, we've got one girl entered in the 3,200 meter run. Let's, let's combine those just because it's more efficient and just run one race. And by rule, in, in that first section of the rule book, it says if all coaches agree to that, then, then that can go ahead, you know, that can go ahead and be, and be done. And, you know, that's fine. But in Colorado, because of the way we qualify for the state before, for the state meet, um, you know, we, we would not accept qualifying, a uh, qualifying mark from any race or event that had been combined where both boys and girls are competing against one another. So just a reminder, you know, if it's a non-qualifying meet, if it's a, you know, JV meet or something like that, and those things arise, as long as the coaches that the competitors are in it, it's fine to do that. And I'll even go a step further and say, if you're at a qualifying meet and you choose to do that, that's fine, but understand what the consequences are. Those marks will not count and not, and not be uploaded, or if they are uploaded, they'll be taken off the, uh, the qualifying marks uh, board, okay? The other one uh, that happens rarely, but but you know I've been to meets where where it's happened as well. And if you have a big meet with a large field of 3,200 meter runners, you know 40, 43 kids, uh, impossible to run that together. So you have a cut or all at once in one in one race, and you know so you've got a couple of choices here. You know if we have that many kids in both the boys and the girls, we're looking at probably splitting those. We're running four sections total of the 3,200 meters, which is probably going to take an hour of time for your meet, and that's fine if you choose to do that. What some places have chosen to do is they will still run one boys race, they will run one race in the inside four lanes, and then they will wheel in a new uh, a starting. Uh, line for the outside four lanes in lanes five through eight. And that's fine. They are started simultaneously. But the, um, the other thing to know about that is that only marks of the athletes that actually start on the engineered starting line, the engineered waterfall there, will be, car will be carried on and eligible for state qualifying marks. Um, you know, because the other starting line is not, you know, hasn't hasn't been engineered inappropriately. So this, the thing to do there would be to take your top, wherever you decide to split that, your top 20 to 22 kids and, you know, have them run on the inside four lanes. That would be your fastest section and then your slowest section on the on the outside. You know, um, and if you have, you know, an, an athlete potentially that, um you know, is it, maybe it's a 1A school, a small school, travels to a bigger meet, and, you know, you really want him in that section that counts because he's going to be running against some good athletes, and it's up for coaches, you know, to really advocate for that athlete to get in the in the uh, section where those things are going to be uh, going to be uploaded. So these are some uh, changes to the bulletin that um, we've made changes. The games committee has made some changes to the uh, state championships for 2023. Um, the first thing, and I believe that that was, this has been uploaded to the website already. So if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to go look, you know, last year in 2022, we finished um, the latest four year cycle of the meet, uh, the state meet. And so in 2023, we start with a new four year cycle. There were some tweaks done by the committee um, in changing the schedule. Uh, the schedule's, you know, uh, pretty tight as it is and so on, but we did make some changes. So on the track, I think the first thing that you're going to see that's different from what we've had before 
Uh, and it will start with, with this year. In odd years, the boys' track events will precede the girls' track events. We've always started the girls' track events, always run first, and, uh, and the boys follow. And we figured, well, well, you know, why not alternate those? The other thing that it does, it does allow um, more recovery time, depending who's going first, uh, for the, if, if we have athletes that wanted to double in the 300 hurdles and the 200 meters, those two races. So there's probably years that are, you know, that before it really, that double really favored uh, the boy athletes over the girls, just because if you look at those times, uh, this way it kind of flips back and forth uh, between the two. In the field, uh, one thing is different, the rotation, uh, now events will rotate every year instead of every other year, they rotate every year between not only uh, classes, but also genders. So really you've got, uh, if you have an athlete that would you know, be a long jumper, for example, over the over four years, that their, whatever their long jump is, would, would probably be in a different spot each of those, each of those four years. Now that's only true for classes uh, two, three, four, and five. Uh, 1A just still rotates gen will gen rotate genders only, uh, just because you know they're they're uh, you know 2A and 3A that are in the afternoon on Thursday we can we can rotate those and uh, 4A 5A that are in the morning on uh, Thursday we can rotate those but you know the, the 1A is just rotating in there with themselves. The other thing that um, that we've done with the field events with some few minor changes. There will not be more in, in your gender classification. The most you will come that will be there are three of three field events on any one day. And uh, you know, sometimes you may have that in one year and the next year maybe you only have two. So, but that's the most that you would have in any one day. There are no more than two field events contested in any classification. On, on the finals day on Saturday. That's a pretty busy day in both track and field. Uh, the vertical, horizontal, uh, horizontals and the throws are all on different days. So in other words, the, you know, the shot put and the discus, never on the same day. Uh, you know, long jump, triple jump, never on the same day. And same thing with the vertical jumps. Now I will clarify that in the 1A vertical jumps, um, whichever, whether it's a girl's year or a boy's year, on Saturday, they do contest the high jump and the pole vault, but they are the, it's the first event and the last event. And there was no real easy way to split that to different days without a, a lot of dominoes falling to do that. So that would be the, that would be the one place that we couldn't fix. The, um, the other item, and we had a couple of these, I know one of them was that in past years, the 2A, I think it was girls, the 2A girls long jump and the 2A pole, uh, girls pole vault were contested at exactly the same time. And, you know, you may have some kids that are doing both of those. So we did eliminate that to where um, uh, gender and event um, are never, or genders are the same and different events aren't contested at the same time. And the other minor change uh, is the change in pole vault start times on Thursday afternoon and Friday afternoon. Those were pushed back uh, a half hour just to allow uh, more time and for those uh, uh, pole vault events to, to remain on time. So take a look at that. And if you have any you know, questions or you know, right now it's just a tentative schedule. Uh, so we're, we're absolutely taking input. If, uh, if you have questions about it, how we arrived at something, uh, please ask. And, and if you have suggestions, we'll listen to those as well. The other thing that, um, that you'll see in a change this year at the state meet would be in the vertical jumps. And if you remember before, uh, increments in all classifications, the high jump were two inches until we had uh, five jumpers remaining. And then we went to the one inch increments. We'll do the same thing. The change there that you see on the slide is we won't go to one inch increments till we have three jumpers remaining. And that's to move the event along a little bit quicker. But the other thing that happens at that time when you get down to three jumpers and the vertical jumps is that they're the time change for um, they have they go from a minute to three minutes. And that's when that's when the event goes to three minutes 
uh, before you have to take or we have to begin your uh, your attempt. And same thing in the pole vault. We have before uh, gone from six inch increments uh, till we've gotten down to five jumpers and then switch it to three. We'll do we'll switch it to three inch increments uh, when we get down to three jumpers now. The other change in the vertical jumps, this was brought up um, and uh, kind of addressed to the games committee. And um, I, I'm glad they did it because, um, you know, in 2A, 3A, 4A, and 5A, there are 18 athletes that qualify to state. In 1A, there are only, there are 10 in the field events. Well, that makes it very difficult, um, you know, if you have a couple of athletes in a vertical jump that no height, that opening height, um, you know, now you're down to eight athletes. So, you know, you've lost that uh, chance to put a, a ninth athlete on the, on the podium. And so uh, we've adjusted the starting heights just in 1A. Everything will still be the same. We start in a high jump two inches below the last qualifier's height. And, but now for 1A, we'll start four inches below the last qualifier's height. And hopefully that uh, won't, be a, won't be a problem in eliminating kids too early in the competition and having some open uh, spots on the podium. In the pole vault, we will still, for all classifications, still do six inches below the last qualifier's height, except in 1A, we will start 12 inches below the last qualifier's height. So that will be a change. Hopefully that will uh, take care of the issue that was, uh, that was brought, before the, uh, brought before the games committee. The other thing that, um, that's a ch the change this year is marking material uh, at Jeffco for the state championship. So uh, there was a lot of chalk that was used last year, you know, sidewalk chalk at the field event venues and, and also on the track for kids marking exchange zones. Very difficult to get that up off the track. And so we're asking that um, we we have no no chalk used on any venue, track and field events as well. So please either use tape or other marking devices like half tennis balls or something other that's not kind of semi-permanent like the chalk is for any reference point that you or your athletes want marked uh, at their event or at their exchange zone. Um, to try to more efficiently check in relay teams at the state meet this year, and also to allow, uh, especially on that Thursday where it's a very field event heavy day as well in the morning and afternoon. And I know a lot of kids, a lot of athletes that are competing in those field events, but also have to leave for a relay. We always had checked in the whole relay team before. So we're going to change that to where now uh, it just takes one relay team member or even potentially a coach that has the relay card in hand and goes down to the check-in tent at the north end of the track and checks in that relay. And then of course, it's the responsibility of those um, remaining athletes that need, need to get there in, in a timely fashion so they can be with the rest of their team, getting final instructions, and walking out to the second staging area in the middle of the track. But hopefully that will, that will help with some kids that are in multiple events, especially those field events. And I think it will also maybe help a little bit of the uh, of the chaos that happens when you've got 18 relay teams down there, uh, you know, trying to get into uh, trying to get checked in for for two different sections of a relay semifinal. Um, the other thing that we've um, we've changed a little bit uh, is field event competitors that report for a track event. Previous verbiage and what we followed was that. Um, not leaving an event, a field event area, any earlier than five minutes prior to the scheduled time of their track event. Uh, we've changed that to 10 minutes, um, you know, and the, the same thing uh, still is in play to make sure that you communicate with the, uh, with the head event judge on when that athlete checks out, whether the coach is doing that communicating or the athlete Make sure you talk to your athletes about that to make sure to check in and make sure that you check when you check out that you check back in um, and that once they are have completed their heat or their final, you know, they need to check in right away, you know, and I know that's an issue when they're uh, especially on Saturday uh, when they're, you know, are get, trying to get their medals and up on the podium and stuff. But to, to go back and check in briefly and say, hey, I'm over here at the award ceremony. As soon as we get done, I'll come right over because those field event people will work with you. And we, we certainly don't want, 
want athletes being left behind in any field event competition. But hopefully the 10 minutes, you know, there's a, a lot going on. The other, the other thing we removed from that statement, I believe it said in prior years, can report no earlier than five minutes or until last call is made. Well, it's difficult, as busy as those announcers are at the state championships to really be on a very, very timely schedule with uh, you know, with those first, second, and final calls, and they can they can vary from time to time. So uh, we're just talking about ten minutes before the scheduled time, and of course, if we have a delay in the in the uh, track because of some weather delay, that changes things too. So uh, usually we're we're pretty much on time when we're starting events. We would never start an event early on the track, um, but we would we would make some announcements if we had a weather delay because that would probably change some things. So a small change there. If you have any questions, um, concerns or whatever, please don't hesitate to contact uh, Jen, uh, myself, and of course I've included Gary Stubel on here as the uh, CTFOA president of officials. Uh, so it just depends on what kind of question you have, uh, or you can shoot it to all three of us and usually one of us can, can uh, make something up to get back to you. So we, we appreciate those questions and don't mind at all working with, uh, working with you to assist you. Uh, throughout the season. So good luck to you and hope to see you uh, throughout the 2023 season. Thank you again, Casey. We truly appreciate all of your hard work and what a great presentation, um, bringing out kind of the nuts and bolts to the surface. So we appreciate all of that. Just a few reminders as we um, end the video today. Uh, it is your responsibility as a coach to review both the bulletin and your rule book. Um, again, you have people at your disposal that we are happy to help interpret or help you um, you know, an answer some of those questions, but it is your job as the head coach to um, understand both of those. Um, I know the bulletin can look like it's a rollover, but there are things um, in there that are, are very much kind of designed to give you um, an update of what we saw last year or as we continue to evolve. So take the opportunity just to read through there. Um, <clears throat> you'll always see the SMAC link that's in there. That's a sports medicine link from Chasa that has um, very much information that you need to know to keep kids safe um, in a variety of ways. So we also ask that you take the opportunity to look through that and share it with your staff um, along with your uh, emergency action plan that you should be doing with your athletic directors. And then again, sharing with your staff and or your students. Um, that is a whole kind of process um, to kind of get that laid out. Hopefully by this time, everybody has that laid out and you're just changing in names and doing your review, uh, but those emergency action plans uh, do save lives. And so we ask that you take that opportunity um, as you begin practice. Um, thanks again to Casey for the work of the schedule. Casey does collect um, a lot of information over those four years, keeps that data, and then tries to work that into the schedule. Um, we do and would love feedback. Please know that we do want feedback that is good for the whole. Um, we understand that there are some things that could be tweaked to make um, your certain scenario better, but we need to realize that we have to make this schedule for everybody across the state. So again, just keep that in mind. Happy to talk through why we've done what we, di we did, um, as Casey mentioned, but um, please know that that is a process that Casey has led and done a very good job uh, now for, I think this will be the third cycle of those four years. So um, it's been great. And I think it's a, a good way to kind of see what's coming at us. Um, in the future. <clears throat> so thank you, Casey, for your work on that. Um, classification, we are in a classification year. Um, by now, your athletic director should have received um, some classification um, tentative placements that came out from our office. Um, you'll just wanna connect with your athletic director, uh, make sure you're on the same page. There is a process of appeals um, and or that you can reach out to me through an appeal process. And then if that doesn't change, then you can actually go in front of the clock committee, which is this February, the 21st. Um, but I do ask that you take a look at that and review those. Um, not a ton of change in track, but definitely there is some movement that can happen based on where your numbers of your enrollment fall. So you wanna take a look at that. Um, and then there is a criteria to do an appeal or to change that placement. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to your athletic director um, and or our office and we're happy to help. And then just one last reminder, all coaching uh, coaches who coach pole vault need to take that um, 
coaching online through the NFHS, and that is an every two year item. So if you are coaching, coaching pole vault, you'll want to make sure that you have that requirement in. And again, that's uploaded into your R school platform. Um, again, huge thank you for taking the time to watch this today. Um, hopefully you can also have your assistant coaches so that everybody is on the same page um, looking through this and you guys can um, kind of go through the season in a, in a quick meeting as you head in uh, to the season. But we're really excited to see an, another great year of track and fields and then ultimately the culminating event of the state track meet um, May 18th through the 20th. So uh, with that, we will sign off. Again, any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're here to help. One thing I always throw out is if you have a uniform question and you're getting ready to, to uh, go ahead and order those, it never hurts just to get a second pair of eyes from us on there so you're not having to reorder something uh, that you may have been misled on through maybe your ordering company. So uh, reach out to us. We're here to help, and we wish you nothing but the best. Thank you, and have a great day.